it's a question of buyer beware, really. <laughs> um, and I've been interested in, in this uh, issue of how markets evolve uh, institutions of regulation for, for some time. It's somewhat Hayekian, it has, has to be said. And, and in fact, uh, we, I, I spoke to Eleanor Ostrom uh, about um, this topic when she came here in 2013, not long before she died, to give the, the Hayek lecture. And she was really quite fascinated by it because it, it is um, very closely aligned to what was her um, research uh, agenda. But the reason why it's relevant um, to this conference, at least somewhat, even if it's not related specifically to digital markets, uh, arose, or uh, the connection in my mind, arose from rereading Akerlof's paper on lemons, uh, the lemons problem. And towards the end of that, he talks about how problems of information asymmetry within markets can be solved without government regulation. Indeed, we know they can be solved without government regulation. But as well as the usual methods which are often discussed, such as warranties in second-hand car markets, etc., he pointed out that markets ev uh, can evolve their own systems of regulation, but he then very perceptively went on to point out that uh, these can cause concerns from a, um, a competition perspective because, because they can uh, create uh, situations of market power. And if you look at the history of how the uh, uh, markets e um, emergent systems of regulation have developed in the UK, that's, th 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 that's, that's exactly the story, that uh, there have been competition concerns uh, surrounding them, and as a result of that, they've often been uh, squashed. So I really just want to give um, uh, uh, f you five short stories uh, in, in my, uh, th the time that I've got available, and then conclude, and specifically conclude about the issues which I think we should be talking about, which, which are not, um, th th um, we shouldn't be talking about uh, regulation in a market failure model. Does the market fail to meet all the um, conditions necessary for welfare optimization? Therefore, should a government regulator come along, pull a lever, and sort that out? But whether or not, um, if, if you like, in a comparative institutional model, uh, market uh, institutions uh, um, have what advantages and relative disadvantages they have compared with government um, institutions of regulation. So story one is about um, uh, stock exchanges. So in Britain, um, modern stock exchanges first developed in coffee shops, such as Jonathan's Coffee House in, in Chain, Change Alley. Um, it's not very complicated, or any of this, so I'll, I'll go through it quite, uh, qu uh, quite quickly. Uh, there was a group of 150 brokers and jobbers uh, who then formed a club in 1761, uh, which superseded the informal arrangements which previously existed. And um, the, the, the club then developed into the first formally constituted um, exchange, uh, regulated exchange, but privately regulated, in 1801. And in the early years, uh, the exchange was regulated by convention, reputation, and informal rules. For example, if you didn't pay up um, uh, at the, when uh, trading on account was introduced, which was, I think, in the early uh, 18th century, your name would be chalked up on a blackboard in the coffee house under the heading lame duck. That's something which particularly amused uh, Eleanor Ostrom because that's exactly the type of mechanism they used to enforce the use of uh, the distribution of uh, things like fishing rights in small African villages. And, and so on. And the first codified rule book was brought in in 1812, and that included provisions for settlement, arbitration, dealing with bad debts, and so on. And then there were also rules uh, to do with uh, transparency, um, uh, uh, the declaration of partnerships, and the quotation of prices. Uh, in fact, the, interestingly, uh, the exchange absorbed uh, losses from an event uh, of market manipulation in 1814, whilst uh, ensuring that those who attempted to profit uh, uh, didn't, uh, didn't gain. In 1844, there's another step when it becomes a requirement for securities that are listed on the exchange um, to be sanctioned by the Stock Exchange uh, Committee. So that's the origin of listing rules. So you have the comple complementary listing rules for companies who have their securities um, uh, traded and uh, the rules uh, relating to the behavior of those who are uh, doing the trading. Both are necessary to uh, increase the uh, um, security of trading on the exchange and thereby reduce the cost of capital uh, to, to um, companies. 
Um, then we have the development, and, and those rules, I should say, uh, are not public goods, they're club goods, they're excludable. If you're not on the ex anybody could um, uh, develop alternative trading arrangements, but if, of course if you were not on the uh, exchange, uh, then those rules wouldn't apply and the reputational benefits of trading via the exchange uh, wouldn't accrue uh, either. Um, then from 1909, um, what had been quite a, a, a long-standing convention was formalised and which prohibited um, uh, um, individuals from both providing broking functions and advice functions and whilst trading on their own book at the same time. So this separation of jobbing and broking which became so controversial in, in um, the, the mid-1980s. Now, Royal Commission um, reported in 1878, and it noted that the exchange's rules had been salutary to the interests of the public, and the, the exchange had acted uprightly and honestly with a desire to do justice. It further commented that the exchange's rules were capable of affording relief and exercising restraint far more prompt and often satisfactory than any within the read of the courts of law. So this is a private regulatory body doing at least as good a job as alternatives that might have existed. Um, and the same was true of the Amsterdam Exchange, which had been um, uh, um, somewhat, uh, 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 had developed somewhat earlier. Uh, uh, now, th these rules were, as Akerlof perceptively points out, um, this, this, uh, this, the exchange had quite significant market power, but there was no doubt also that it was contestable. You could, it was not, uh, there was no legal uh, monopoly here. You were not required to deal through the exchange. Um, you, you could uh, deal off exchange. You could provide investment advice if you were not a member of the exchange and so on. Um, but also there were other capital markets which countries, uh, which companies could uh, use. So with the totally unregulated euro bond market, for example, and, um, uh, and although following the Second World War, it has to be said that the development of competition was somewhat limited by the existence of exchange control. But then we have Big Bang uh, in, in 1986, and Big Bang effectively prohibited the stock exchange from imposing certain rules on competition uh, grounds, indeed most of the important uh, uh, ones. So although exchanges still exist, they still have their own rule books, most of the regulatory functions have now passed to uh, statutory uh, uh, regulators. And Big Bang is often regarded as this sort of great act of Thatcherite deregulation. In, in fact, it wasn't. It was a uh, prohibition on a private rulemaking body uh, which prevented it from uh, enforcing its own rules on its own uh, members who freely decided to be members of that exchange, which was a mutual as well, so they also owned uh, the exchange. So it was a, it was a government uh, limitation of uh, the autonomy of a private rulemaking body, essentially. It, it wasn't an act of uh, deregulation, except in a slightly um, uh, reductionist sense. And, and th this arose, th this, um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, the Big Bang arose as a result of an agreement between the exchange and, um, and the government to call off an office of fair trading uh, inquiry. Uh, so it, it was driven by competition uh, concerns. The exchange was abusing monopoly power. Okay, story two, professions. Uh, until 1990, the accounting professions were um, uh, independent and their standards formed recommendations to members of the profession. And um, uh, those standards were produced by the, the, by the profession. The first standard that was produced by the UK accounting profession, SAP 1, published in 1971, was just eight pages long. Um, in recent years, um, professions and their activities have been increasingly regulated by government bodies. Uh, the international financial reporting standards now effectively dictate uh, how uh, companies report. Um, they are, um, uh, uh, and, and they made compulsory within the European Union. They are now over 3,000 pages long. Um, they're imposed by uh, most governments, and in fact, the international financial reporting standards um, now require to be approved by the EU before they are adopted by the nominally independent international um, uh, IFRS. Um, but firms subjected themselves to audit long before governments required it. So by 1926, 90% of companies quoted on the New York Stock Exchange had audited accounts, even though there was no statutory requirement uh, for that. And professional bodies of accountants, with their own rules, um, uh, um, were responsible for doing the auditing, by and large. 
and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, just like British bodies, uh, had codes of conduct uh, for their members, and if you didn't abide by those codes of conduct, you would be thrown out. It was a private regulatory uh, association. Now, it was, somewhat uh, it, it was somewhat monopolistic, that's why it's relevant to this discussion, and in fact there were no real scandals arising, as far as I can work out, until the US government um, prohibited the professional body from prohibiting its members from advertising, once again, on competition grounds. Uh, and um, so this is a question really of whether or not we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Once that uh, intervention in the rules of uh, the profession on competition grounds uh, had been made, there were the uh, accounting professions became uh, much more commercialised and um, the, the, uh, the, the, the accounting scandals uh, began to uh, arise. I, I should add just in passing that I think professional associations get a bad reputation in free market uh, circles because they often campaign for and often obtain um, statutory um, uh, reserved roles and I, I think that has brought them into disrepute uh, somewhat. Now, the third story is uh, industry agreements, and the, the one that I particularly uh, want to refer to here is the Life Insurance Maximum Commission Agreement um, up to the mid-1980s. Now, oddly enough, I can't find um, a picture of the Life Insurance uh, Maximum Commission Agreement of the mid-1980s, uh, so um, in, instead you've got one here on uh, Sunday shopping. And I just to mention in passing that I don't... Um, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the competition rules are applying to this, but I'm just uh, uh, a thought experiment, if you like. When it comes to uh, Sunday opening, why don't we just liberalise, but why don't the competition authorities say that if um, shops in a particular area want to agree together their opening hours on a, uh, a Sunday, they will be entitled to do that and not subject to uh, uh, competition uh, interventions. Um, but anyway, back to uh, life insurance um, maximum commission agreement, which you'll have to imagine uh, in your mind. Um, by this agreement, up until 1984, uh, the major life insurance uh, uh, companies uh, had an agreement whereby uh, they would not pay more than a certain amount of commission on policies that were sold uh, by brokers. And you're either in that agreement or you're out of that agreement. And the companies which decided not to be in the agreement, on the whole, were known to be shall we say, not so reputable. Sometimes they were not so reputable, but, but quite innovative. So th there was that uh, trade-off uh, to some extent. Um, so this effectively prevented brokers from selling policies to uh, p potential policyholders on the basis of the, of the amount of commission they would receive and required them to look at other uh, factors uh, in, instead. Uh, that agreement was abolished uh, under pressure from the European Union and pending investigation by the uh, Office of Fair Trading uh, again. Um, on competition grounds, um, presumably the main losers were deemed to be the insurance brokers. It's difficult to see, uh, which I wouldn't regard as a particularly high public policy uh, um, uh, uh, priority, it's difficult to see how customers themselves would be significantly disadvantaged by it. But anyway, Ever since then, um, of course, there have been never-ending mis-selling scandals related to the sale of insurance products motivated by the commission which insurance brokers receive from um, selling, um, um, uh, sell it, selling those, those products. And we now literally have thousands of paragraphs of conduct of business regulation produced by the, the um, FSA, now the, the FCA, which is designed essentially to deal with this problem. And, and in my view, in doing so, also um, prevents tacit information flowing through the market, which I, I think um, is a, 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 a significant problem uh, in um, financial services uh, uh, markets. Um, and as one of the earliest uh, speakers mentioned, that uh, we also have the requirements to um, for in financial services companies to provide information of certain types to customers and that can often, um, because it, th these things tend to be overinterpreted by the sellers of financial products, that can often be dozens or even hundreds of pages long and it goes entirely unread uh, by customers. Now, story four, so far this one is a bit more, um, uh, th this one hasn't really been intervened with, but it's just another example of how uh, uh, organisations evolve within uh, markets to regulate markets without the, the, the need for the 
the uh, state uh, to do so is the International S uh, S um, Swaps and Derivatives uh, Association. So ISDA's mission is to foster safe and efficient derivatives markets to facilitate effective risk management for all users of derivative products. And it achieves this by developing standardised documentation globally to promote legal certainty and maximum risk reduction. Members have to apply to join ISDA and can have their membership uh, uh, rejected uh, or revoked for that matter. And members can choose to use what is known as the ISDA Master Agreement, which covers, its, uh, you might say it's a bit monopolistic, it covers 90% of all outstanding derivatives contracts, uh, which is 0.5 quadrillion, I'm um, not sure how many noughts that is, Steve will tell us, 0.5 quadrillion dollars. Um, and um, so again, people might raise an eyebrow from a competition perspective, um, but um, in, in addition to its uh, regulatory function, ISDA also has a dispute resolution procedure, so a kind of uh, informal court, uh, if, if you like, and uh, which avoids the use of uh, government courts in, in most uh, instances. Um, finally, just uh, before I conclude, just let me mention Uber. Um, so Uber is an individual company, of course. So it's not a it's not a um, uh, a cartel like um, Story Three or an organisation like Stories One, Two, and Four. It's a it's a company, but it's got a clear regulatory structure and a clear regulatory uh, function, um, both for drivers and for customers. I've never used it except riding with with, with somebody else. I've only recently got a mobile phone that works, <laughs> uh, and um, it, it's recently. Come come under the uh, um, scrutiny from the Competition and Markets Authority, but not actually for its regulatory function for a, a proposed merger with another uh, uh, company. But no, I think we should remember that Uber, apart from it being a very effective uh, provider of uh, taxi-like services, uh, does something very important. It, it's a platform for competition between uh, uh, drivers, but it's also a vehicle for regulatory uh, competition. Uh, customers and drivers could choose between demand responsive, responsive pricing of Uber, uh, together with its mechanism for um, uh, uh, regulation of both drivers and customers. Well, I gather if you have, have too many on a night out and you throw up in the back of an Uber, you're likely not to be accepted ne next time you try and um, uh, uh, order an, an Uber. And if you rate drivers, if drivers get uh, a bad rating successively, then um, they run into problems too. Um, you could choose between that system of regulation and the fixed pricing system of um, taxi uh, regulation, which tends to be run by uh, local authorities or the tra Transport for London uh, in, in London. And we should have, and I think we should celebrate, that kind of regulatory uh, competition. And I think if anything is done to undermine that on competition grounds, it would be a great uh, shame. So, to, to conclude, um, um, recogni recognition of, of private forms of regulation c came from a rather surprising source, the uh, uh, Akerlof in his Lemons paper. He seems to have forgotten all about it, but um, because if he, if he ever talks about regulation, he, he's a great fan of regulation on market failure grounds. But um, no, he, he made, as, as I said earlier, really rather a profound uh, point that markets can develop institutions which uh, can um, provide regulation, but those institutions might give cause for concerns on market power uh, grounds. But then we have to do have to compare um, those institutions with the uh, alternatives. And um, so private forms of regulation can be monopolistic or cartelistic. They can encourage private. Uh, they can encourage restrictive practices but they always are contestable by nature. But government regulation is always monopolistic by nature and normally doesn't allow any regulatory competition whatsoever. Um, it doesn't allow you, the FCA doesn't allow you to operate outside the regulated market and stamp your products unregulated. You're, you, you have to be within the perimeter that the FCA um, uh, regulates. Um, and, and you could get two years in prison for uh, operating outside that uh, perimeter. So the competition authorities, when looking at things like professions, Uber, ISDA, industry agreements, cartels, exchanges, etc., um, I think should just sort of chill out a bit. And, and when, when thinking about whether to take action, they should think, you know, com compared with what? What might be the alternative to this 
um, the, this structure which might inhibit competition uh, slightly. Private regulation, it should be said, can't necessarily deal with broader public uh, interest issues which are outside the domain or affect those who are not actually part of the um, market in which they're um, operating. But no, we have a long history of regulating specifically or passing specific laws to deal with those types of things in the UK. Certainly did in the financial sector before 1986. Um, one problem is that the sanctions of, with, of private regulation is that the sanctions available to um, private regulators might be uh, limited. They're limited to things like uh, my profession can fine me quite considerable sums of money or it can kick me out, but it can't put me in prison. Um, on the other hand, um, government regulators might, get, might be taken over by interest groups, including the industry itself, and the more complex regulation becomes, I think, the more likely that is. Um, uh, and um, that will have uh, uh, harmful effects too. And then finally, there's, there is a, the, the knowledge problem. In advance, we do not know the best way to, to regulate. That was one of the advantages, I think, of the um, idea of mutual recognition within the, the, the original vision of the European single market, that you could have regulatory uh, competition and regulatory evolution and perhaps harmonisation through uh, evolution. Um, but private regulators are, despite the market power that they might accrue, um, at least exposed to competition. So the stock exchange in the 1980s, it, there's no question that it, it got behind the times in terms of how it regulated its members, but it had competition at the edges, both from off-exchange trading and also other, um, uh, other capital markets. And if you hadn't got exchange control, that competition would probably have been uh, more fierce. Um, but uh, when you have statutory regulators, the, the, the question of, um, of how do, do regulators evolve and adapt, um, a, a, adapt to changing market circumstances, how do they know in advance what the best form of regulation is, is, is something which uh, is a question which really I think is uh, very difficult to answer. And my strong conclusion really is simply that we should have more curiosity about non-governmental forms of, of regulation. Uh, we can, in certain contexts, I think, uh, consider regulation as being like a set of services that the market can provide. And it was that curiosity, of course, about these kinds of things which led Eleanor Ostrom to produce her groundbreaking work in um, uh, environmental, the management of environmental uh, uh, re resources. And, and this binary market failure, government failure, public choice model um, that, that we normally consider regulatory uh, um, uh, questions uh, within, I, I, I just think, is far too unsubtle to deal with the realities of what can arrive, arise within a market. Okay, thanks. Do we have any questions for Philip? Cento, over to you. Oh, do we have a microphone? Yeah, just a couple of disparate comments. One is, what is the theory? You, you've pa painted the picture mm. of self-regulation, professional regulation, mm -hmm. and it goes into public regulation. So is there some trend or market, for, you know, demand and supply for that type of uh, development over time? Mm -hmm. And on, the pr on self regulation, you can say, well, they're contestable. And, but there have been instances, let's take Sir Gordon Burry's uh, attack on uh, the professions, mm. regulation of the professions and opening up the legal services market to non-legal conveyances, mm -hmm. now allowing them to advertise. Now, is it the case all delivery companies who are, you know, mm -hmm. closed shops? Now, th th they were all private regulation mm -hmm. th through um, basically suppliers of the products. Uh, and they weren't necessarily in the consumer, so they, they were regulating the profession. You could argue that that's an example of self-regulation. Mm -hmm. The question was, is it good self-regulation? Right, okay. We tip over yeah. to no, no, sure. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I definitely don't want to make um, the argument that uh, it, in in protesting about the sort of the, the, the government um, all stepping in and regulating markets and, and sometimes undoing these forms of private regulation, I, I don't want to sort of 
fall into the trap of making Chicago-like arguments that the market will also always produce perfect uh, answers. I want to make more evolutionary arguments that you know, it is possible for these, um, the, these institutions to develop. Um, yes, of course, it's possible for them to develop flaws. The important thing is that they are, um, they are contestable and that they don't have legal um, privileges. And that's not to say that you know, by, by the mid-1980s that the, stock, the London Stock Exchange had not um, got to a position where its regulations were really um, uh, out, out, out of date. Now, um, I don't want to take the reductionist position that the reason why that was all the fault of, of government. It might have been different, though, had we not had exchange control after the Second World War and it was possible to have easier to have international competition between exchanges. On, on the specific question of the, the legal profession, that, I think that is interesting. Yeah, I think the law profession ought to be able to prohibit its members from advertising. Um, but the question on, um, on co uh, about conveyancing, surely that was a... That was a government restriction, was it not? not that sure you couldn't either. convey a house until you were uh, a qualified um, lawyer. That, that was, must have been the removal of a, gov of a government... Um, I don't think you need a lawyer to convey a house. Sorry? I'm not sure you ever needed a lawyer to convey a house. No, you didn't, but you'd be foolish if you didn't have one and it went wrong. So even before 84? It would, have all, it would have always been a poor decision because if, yeah, if you okay. did it wrong, you wouldn't have anyone so, to sue. So what happened in eighty? <laughs> what happened in eighty four then? Um, I think I think it was deregulated so that licensed conveyances could yeah. advertise as a regulated. Probably the, the okay. Only right. To convey a property was a lawyer. But okay. You could convey it yourself. With it. You, you certainly could can. convey it yourself, yes. Can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Opticians are, is, is a good example where you, where you definitely had a... Uh, opticians had a statutory uh, uh, mon monopoly. Uh, actuaries, I mean actuary, they didn't have any... St apart from a, a, a very historical world in relation to friendly societies, until the early 1980s, they didn't have any reserved rules at all. But, um, no, now, now, now they have several. But, uh, and... Uh, yeah, OK, so I'm, I'm not suggesting there's perfection here, but just that you should allow yeah. contestability in evolution. Yeah. yeah. Um, right, quickly squeezing one more question, uh, Mark. Uh, yes, well, it's a really narrow question. I probably should have asked you this at some point in the last 12 years, Philip. What, what, <laughs> what, why is it the case that the Big Bang of 1986 is so widely, but in your view, so inaccurately, seen as a liberalising event? Um, well, it's a pretty subtle argument, isn't it, that it's a prohibition of the exchange regulating its members in certain ways. But it was also part of a Thatcher general approach, which relates to what you were saying about the legal profession, Cento, of, um, and, and also the unions of... of uh, uh, actually legislating to outlaw what were regarded as restrictive practices. And that's generally come under the name of deregulation. Um, so, you know, some of us would have debates about trade unions and be quite comfortable with their immunities being uh, uh, removed, but not very comfortable with all the Thatcherite regulation which restricted their activity, restricted clothes shops, uh, etc., uh, etc. So it, it was part of a, that Thatcherite attack on what were regarded as... Um, vested interests, which were not always legally protected um, vested interests. Um, so what was the second? Uh, no, OK. No, that's... Um, You've it. Yeah, fine. OK. Right. Thank you, Philip. Thanks. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.